From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hey everybody, welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Maggie Vespa in for Laurel Porter and we don't have to tell you for the better part of this month, Oregon has been gripped by severe wildfires across most of the state. Over Labor Day weekend, it became clear the risk was high. Hot, dry weather would be followed by an unprecedented windstorm. And for the first time ever, PGE shut off some power lines because of the fire danger. And they were right. On Monday, the strong winds took down lines, many of which were still live, and that sparked new fires and they spread like wildfire. Other small fires were already burning. Those quickly grew out of control. Almost a million acres burned and at least nine people lost their lives so far. Thousands of homes are gone and for many, their sense of safety has been rattled. Fires in Clackamas County put Portland's close in suburbs on alert to evacuate many for the first time ever. And blame has been placed on climate change, on poor forest management, even suburban sprawl. And like most things, the answer is much more complicated than any one of those things. So joining me today, we have three experts from Portland State University, two of them first, one later. You can see on our screen here, Paul Loiketh, Associate Professor for the Department of Geography. His specialty is atmospheric science and climate. And then we have Max Nielsen Pincus, Associate uh, Professor and Department Chair of the Department of Environmental Science and Management. His expertise is in the human dimension, fire risk management, and how it impacts communities. And then later on, We'll have number three, Andres Holes, who's the associate professor in the Department of Geography. He studies wildfires and the relationship between fire, climate, and people. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to the two of you. We'll bring in Andres later. We want to start with the conditions that led to this, especially the windstorm that we talked about. So I'll go to Paul first. And Paul, can you kind of talk about why this particular event was so dangerous? And you mentioned something in our call yesterday, a loaded dice analogy. What was that? Yeah, so oftentimes when talking about extreme events like this in the context of climate change, um, the loaded dice analogy is used. And I think that is a really appropriate analogy for um, thinking about how what we saw and what we've been going through um, is kind of contextualized with climate change. So the loaded dice analogy is basically saying that climate change is continuously loading the dice in favor of the conditions and ingredients necessary for a catastrophe like this to come together at the same time. And that's primarily in this case connected to an increase in temperature. So if we think back to Labor Day weekend, um, prior to the wind event itself, we had several days of really warm temperatures. Um, and a warm atmosphere is able to hold more water vapor, so warmer air can more effectively and more thoroughly and more quickly evaporate moisture from the forest. Anyone who may have been hiking in the Cascades on Sunday before Labor Day, like I was, can attest to how hot that air mass was. I was well above Timberline on Mount Hood, and it was oppressively hot. And you don't expect temperatures to be that hot way up, you know, 7,000 feet on the mountain, but they really were. So this was an atmosphere that was just baking, and it was baking the mountains throughout the elevation range. So those types of events we know with high confidence are becoming more common, um, they're more frequent, and they're more severe as a result of global warming. So this is how climate change in one way is manifesting itself um, globally and locally with more extreme heat. That extreme heat, again, kind of primes the forest, um, kind of got it, got it ready to burn um, when conditions became even more favorable the next day. So the windstorm is a whole other um, um, kind of side of this equation, a really important side of this equation, we saw, as you said, Maggie, a really unprecedented windstorm for this time of year on Labor Day afternoon into Labor Day evening and then the days following. That windstorm brought another round of extremely dry air, so any moisture that could have been left in the forest would have been evaporated. In fact, you may have noticed when branches fell um, due to the wind in your neighborhood, they, the leaves on those branches were crispy almost immediately. That air was so dry that it was evaporating moisture out of the forest, priming it to burn even more. Um, and then, of course, the, the wind can fan the flames and spread embers and, and, and make the fire travel um, much faster. So that, that really was a perfect storm for the catastrophe and the tragedy that we saw um, um, with these fires. Now, the question about climate change and wind has been coming up, and that kind of gets to questions that are at the frontier of climate science research, questions about how atmospheric circulation, how waves in the jet stream, this ribbon of strong winds at the top of the atmosphere that kind of marks the boundary between cold Arctic air and warmer air further south. How is that all going to respond to a warming climate? 
Um, and that's a place where there's really active scientific research and sort of vigorous scientific discussion going on. Um, so it's really hard to say with this particular wind event, whether that's something we would expect to become more common or less common or more severe or less severe into the future. I think the scientific community is kind of still playing that out, um, but we're not at where we have the, sort of the consensus to make a really confident attribution statement on a particular event like this. One thing we can say though, is it's really hard to assess any trend in an event like this because it's so rare that the data points are really pretty sparse. So this really was a standout wind event. Um, and, and lastly, all weather is happening in the context of a changing climate. So you know, there's, there's an effect of climate change on everything. Um, the question is really um, how much and in what direction. And that's where the science is, is playing out on things like this wind event but the conclusive evidence for the temperature is just really, really strong. Sure, and I want to go to Max in a second, but Paul, one more question for you. You brought up something, and it was like you'd been listening to our newsroom conversations um, in the months prior to this fire event, and you brought up that the summer was relatively cool. The risk didn't seem that high, but just like a few days of the right conditions set us up for this disaster. So how quickly can things change in that regard? Right, that's a really good point. Um, you know, compared to some of the most recent summers, it wasn't all that hot when you add up June, July, and August. Um, but so early September is on average our driest kind of conditions are at their driest of the entire year or at the end of the dry summer just to begin with. So things are, are typically dry that time of year. But a hot air mass like we saw the, the days prior to the wind event and then the dry winds with that wind event can, can suck out the remaining moisture really, really effectively. Um, I think that the, those more immediate preceding conditions really primed things for explosive fires more so than what was happening in July or June or before that. Um, um, at that time of year, with the limited moisture, it doesn't take much to, to really um, uh, evaporate what's left. And we saw an extremely effective atmosphere doing that. Okay. And I want to bring in uh, Max. And Max, as you know, the damage is still being tallied. But, I mean, it's very clear we've seen entire towns wiped out in Southern Oregon and in Lane County and in counties much closer to Portland. Um, you talked about the possibility of protecting high risk communities from fire. How, how do we go about doing that moving forward? Yeah, thanks, Maggie. It's a, it's, it's a tricky pr challenge. Um, we've, as a society, we've invested most of our resources for mitigation work for adapting to wildfire into much drier climate zones, so east of the mount, east of the Cascade Mountains here in Oregon, uh, but around the Intermountain West, typically in the interior rather than in the wet forests of the the Cascades or the Coast Range. Uh, so this is something that we need to to grapple with. Um, we we think of these fires that we've uh, experienced over the course of the last couple of weeks as unprecedented and for most of us they are in our lifetime but as Andres Holtz who you'll talk to later will will can talk about as well is that we do have a historical record that shows uh, these types of large fire events occurring west of the Cascades and and even in in recent history mod, well modern history uh, we do have experiences like the Tillamook fires the Yakult burn the Silverton fires uh, of the last 150 years or so that, that suggests this type of event is possible to occur. So the question is then how do we, how do we um, prepare for it? How do we adapt our communities to be resilient to these kinds of experiences? And, and it's not an easy question. We can do things like hardening uh, roofs, uh, changing from cedar shake roofs uh, and siding uh, to metal roofs, for example, or other fire resistant siding. Uh, we can do things like defensible space uh, around homes that allows firefighters to get in and, and, and protect structures uh, when fires do come. Uh, and we can do thinning and, and forest management around communities as well. But, you know, the, I think what's one of the things that's novel and, and, and unique about the experience that we've been through the last couple of weeks, uh, much of the growth of these fires uh, occurred, you know, between midnight or, or whenever they ignited uh, or, or started to grow. Uh, and in the morning, the next morning. So we, you know, a lot of communities really had no time uh, to plan or to prepare uh, and and evacuate. Uh, and it was a really a, just an emergency situation uh, that, that created the tragedy that we've seen. Um, one of the things that a lot of the work that I do is to think about what the impacts of wildfires are to communities. We also, we think about preparation, but also the impacts 
Um, and we can think of these as, uh, you know, typically we think of impacts of what's happening before the fire, what happens during the fire, what happens after the fire. Um, you know, a lot of the communities that are in uh, sort of more metropolitan urban areas, uh, as soon as the evacuation orders are, are over, um, they'll, they'll recover, you know, they'll return, people will return to their homes, they'll return to life, uh, such as that life is a little abnormal right now anyways with the pandemic, but they will uh, return. Um, you know, it's the rural communities that I think are, 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 we have to look at more about what that recovery plan looks like. Um, we've seen, we've done studies that have shown, you know, you can see unemployment and wages, you see a drag for months or even uh, years after fires in communities across the West, uh, as, you know, people fear returning for recreation from a blackened landscape. Uh, or the natural resource sectors, uh, you know, lose the projects that were queued up and ready to go uh, as um, the, or that got burned over by, by wildfires. So we can expect some of that. But I think, you know, we here we have a different um, uh, a different experience and then that, that we haven't, at least in Oregon, really experienced in, in uh, recent history, which is the, the, you know, the destruction and devastation of whole communities. And that's really going to be a question of, of how do we build resilience into these communities uh, going forward. Um, a lot of the communities that, that were uh, destroyed or heavily impacted by these uh, fires were communities that had um, existing vulnerabilities. And you can think of it like healthcare. It's like pre-existing conditions. So you've got more mobile homes, you've got lower education, more poverty, lower incomes in these communities. And I think the question that we have to ask ourselves as a as a society or as a collective right now is, is are we going to let those vulnerabilities determine their future, or can we pull together, uh, at, you know, from with with other communities, with the state, uh, with federal assistance, to help rebuild in a way um, that makes them more resilient in the future, that takes those types of adaptations I was talking about earlier in terms of the built structures. Uh, the area around the home, uh, the areas around communities to make them more adapted to fire events that may happen in the future. My second question to you, and I asked you this on the phone yesterday, and, and all of you um, sort of smiled a little bit because I'm sure you've seen a lot of this conversation as we all have, the idea of climate refugees. And there were just so many articles that came out about people potentially leaving the West Coast in mass um, because of conditions like this making it, quote unquote, unlivable. So, I mean, Max, what's your what's your take on the um, the emergence of those conversations after this event? Yeah, I mean, I think there is some evidence uh, for the idea of climate refugees. And we certainly um, just right here on my street, we have uh, uh, some neighbors who moved in recently after their home was lost in Southern California and moved to Portland to escape the fires. And then, of course, they were socked in smoke uh, several weeks later. Um, you know, that said, uh, most of the research that I've seen looking at climate refugees uh, suggests that, you know, what climate does is it intensifies the pipeline of migrations that already exist. Um, so we can, I think, expect people from uh, some other parts of the country to, to move towards the Northwest. I don't know that we're going to see a huge out-migration of people from the Northwest. We live in a in a, um, a pretty well adapted climate from a climate change perspective, at least um, uh, relative to some other places. I, I guess the last thing I'll say on that is, you know, I grew up here in the Pacific Northwest in Portland, and and we always thought of the rest of the country as like these these places where how, why would you want to live there around tornadoes and hurricanes? So so everywhere across the country, I think has uh, you know some of the the types of challenges that we experience as far as natural disasters and the risks that we face from living in the places that we live. All right, well, Max I think and Paul, maybe the last thing to say about it is that particularly in these rural uh, communities, you know, people have a strong and long historical connection to these communities. Um, and that isn't e easily uh, disrupted. All right, well, great points. Guys, I really appreciate your time. We're gonna throw it to break and then bring back your colleague, Andres Holtz. Uh, thank you so much again for your expertise. It's really uh, comforting to help people wrap their minds around this historic event. We're back in a couple of minutes.
Hey everybody, welcome back to Straight Talk. I'm Maggie Vespa in for Laurel Porter and today we're talking about the wildfires that tore through Oregon over the last two weeks and more importantly the science behind what happened and why it happened the way it did. Welcome again to our guests from Portland State University, Associate Professor Paul Loiketh and Associate Professor, newcomer for this segment, Andre Holes. We also just heard from Associate Professor Max Nielsen Pincus. We're going to bring in Andres now. Thank you guys for being here. Um, I don't have to tell you that, like in all things in 2020, this has gotten political. The president has blamed the fires on poor forest management. Um, Senator Merkley called that a devastating lie, and Washington Governor Jay Inslee called them climate fires. So, Andres, given all that, can this be simplified to just one cause? Um, hi, thanks for having me here. No, definitely not. I think um, we need leaders who embrace um, comprehensive approaches and uh, understand the science over simple rhetoric or who understand the solutions that require commitment and resources that are really needed. Um, we can look at records elsewhere where very little management has happened like Alaska or the boreal forests in Canada and Russia and fires are going wild there as well and no management has to happen there so we know very clearly that it's not just management whatsoever we talked about sort of the mega fires of today and how sort of we were set up for these fires um andres i mean just what's your take on sort of how these got to be so destructive and more importantly moving forward what our leaders should take from this i mean you just talked about um, that sort of more comprehensive approach. What would you, if you had their ear, be telling them? Yeah, that's a great point and great question. I think we need, we have different ecosystems. We have different forests in Oregon and across the Pacific Northwest. And hence we have different fire regimes, different fire types. Um, uh, as a consequence of that, we need different management that actually it's, um, customize or actually takes that into account. There's no really one size fits all solution. That's honestly not gonna work here or elsewhere. And so we need to understand that our Western Cascade forests are very different from our drier forests on the east side or even different from the, our forests in the Southwest of Oregon, for instance. And so in places like Western Oregon, the Cascades and our wet forest, um, Fuels is ne not necessarily, um, in terms of their amount, an issue. Uh, here, the main historic limitations of fires is how wet historically this uh, forest uh, used to be or tended to be. And so we needed extreme weather climate conditions for hot fires on this forest. And we, if we look back in the record, we see huge events that have happened every 80, every 150 or even more years. Um, the difference is that under climate change, as Paul mentioned before, um, the weather and climate is it's loaded. And so we expect more of this extreme and more of this um, longer fire season and longer droughts that will dry out these abundant fuels. On the west side, if anything, um, management has changed how fires behave in plantations. If you think about it, people, when they go hiking, you can think of, for instance, mature old growth forests where they see lots of logs and mosses and lots of complexity. Um, uh, a fire, which is like a fluid moving in the air, has difficulties of actually moving around in these very wet, soaked, wet and shady conditions. In contrast, a plantation, particularly a large plantation with young trees, that have all exactly the same size is much more homogeneous and much more easy for fires to spread. And we have data, we have studies that come out of Southwestern Oregon that show very clearly that the places that burns more severely tend to be plantations that are homogeneous and young. And we also have data that forests that are more complex that have higher biomass, in other words, old growth, tend to resist fire better. To the degree, I want to bring Paul back in that this has been influenced by climate change. Paul, you said something on our call that uh, I thought was a really uh, sort of clean, understandable metaphor. You said people look at this and because this event is so extreme and they worry that we've gone over a cliff when it comes to climate change. And you said it's more of a slope. What exactly does that mean? 
Yeah, so so I think it's really kind of almost natural to to see what we've been through and to experience what we've went through and think that we've fallen off some climate change cliff into into um, um, you know the word new normal gets used a lot when we talk about these extreme events. Um, but I think it's really important to kind of take a step back and and think about climate change more as a slope or as a ramp. So the climate's been changing due to human activity for decades. It's going to continue to change. Um, due to human activity as we go into the future. The more that change piles up, the more noticeable and more impactful the effects are. So, so we start to see them more. Um, but we haven't fallen off a, you know, a cliff where things are fundamentally different now as far as climate change in late September than they were, say, at the beginning of September. And, and as we've talked about, you know, these, these types of, of ingredients coming together in concert to create fires like this are still extremely unlikely in any given year. That doesn't mean that they they won't happen again, they will, and it doesn't mean that climate change isn't loading the dice so that they're potentially more likely to happen going into the future, um, especially again with those warming temperatures as we continue to warm going into the future. Um, but it's you know it's still a, a really extreme event and it will continue to be an extreme event as far as you know uh, being being super rare and 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 um, having uh, low, le- you know, a, a low level of probability for any given year. Of course, it could, you know, something like this could just sort of by chance happen again in the near future. It could, it could be a while before we see something like this. But the important thing is that this this slope or this ramp of a changing climate is really what we're marching along. Um, it's not sort of a step function into a fundamentally different regime than we were a few weeks ago. We joked, Paul, that I was going to make you be a therapist when you're a scientist. But for people who are incredibly anxious and they've watched this for the last couple of weeks and just climate anxiety, quote unquote, is is overwhelming them right now. And they might be looking at you and might go, oh, my God, how does that guy sleep at night? But what, what, what would you tell them? I mean, you know, just any any advice human to human, given that you know more about it than we do. Right. I mean, I, I think it's difficult. And I think. Um, I think it, it's it's maybe more difficult in some ways for someone like me to relate because it it is my every day and it's it's you know it's what I study for a living and have studied for a living for for quite some time now. So when you're sort of immersed in it, it's uh, you have a very different perspective than 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 people who aren't immersed in it. Um, but I do think that 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 sort of ramp analogy or that slope analogy is important to keep in mind. That means that you know there there are you know, there, there is opportunity to do things to um, to prepare for change that we see coming, or to try to mitigate that change. Um, and when you when you kind of have the, the the perspective of weather variability and climate change, um, you know these these really extreme weather events that we see, even if their probability is being increased because of climate change, as it is for especially temperature related extremes, we know that with a lot of confidence. You know, they are still discrete events. So, so you know, this this particular event, um, you know, will pass. Um, it, you know, it, and and things will return to what feels like a more comfortable situation. Um, you know, these discrete events are kind of just that. But it's it is hard because the the change that we've experienced is is relatively small compared to the change that we we know we're going to continue to experience. So. So the uncertainty into the future is understandable, and um, uh, you know I, I think I think that anxiety, you know, that anxiety it, it is is justifiable in a lot of ways. But I am a scientist; I study this, I, and I'm not a psychologist. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, Andres, last question for you. We have a little bit less than a minute left. I apologize. You mentioned that there's a possibility for a warning system with wildfires, like what we have for hurricanes. Um, what goes into that? What will we look for if if that were to come to fruition? I think that could um, be following the model of the hurricanes or the tornadoes that everybody would get uh, alerts which were meant to be given and also the energy providers which I think now um, from every catastrophe right we can learn and we can use as an opportunity to grow for instance um, we can prioritize and fund forest management that also but I don't know, buried power lines, for instance. I, I heard like 17 of the fires in Oregon were actually started by power lines that were damaged. And so right there, there's one activity that we need to consider and, and think about. 
All right, I could talk to you guys all day, but I really appreciate your time and expertise. I think it's great for people to hear. Uh, again, Paul Loiketh, Andres Holes, and Max Nielsen Pinkus, uh, Pinkus, all from Portland State. We appreciate it. Thank you guys for joining us here on Straight Talk. We'll see you back next week.